morning, good morning. If each and every one of you grab your hymn books, please, and stand with me and turn to hymn number 46. When I see the blood, 46. When I see the blood, we'll sing the first and the last, 46. Christ our Redeemer died on the cross, died for the sinner, paid all his due. Sprinkle your blood with the blood of the Lamb, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Oh, great compassion, oh, boundless love, oh, loving kindness, faithful and true. Find peace and shelter under the blood, and I will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. Amen. All right. Good morning. Well, before we start with announcements and Sunday, let's go ahead and uh, take some prayer requests and we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Anybody have anything on this side? All right. Yes, sir. Wait, start that over again. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. All right. So pray for uh, Brother Scott, for, uh, for his wife, Christine, her Aunt Bev, her health, and his brother has COPD. What's his name? Brendan. Brendan. All right. Anybody in the middle? All right. Yes. Uh, uh, Evan. Okay. So pray for his boss's sister. All right. Miss uh, Bromley. All right. All right. Brother Steenrod. Yes. Yes. And pray for our building. Okay. All right. So if you would, I have a request for the, uh, the true family. Um, I was on a uh, police ride along, and um, uh, this gentleman passed away. Um, had a heart attack or something. I'm not sure. So uh, it was pretty tough. So uh, the true family, I believe the wife's name is Jennifer True. If you would pray for them. Um, just just so I'm going to try to go visit the family on Tuesday or maybe tomorrow. I don't know. So if you'd pray for them. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, just pray for God. Hey, pray for Brother Tim's uh, mom and dad. Uh, just pray for them, if you would. Pray for Tim in this, because he's trying to figure out what he's going to do with everything. So, like hard decisions, like big decisions. So, like, like, like I'm talking earth changing, where he has to bring them here, maybe or something. I don't know, but it's so. Just pray for him on that one. So. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you. God, you are God. You're the God of truth and, and righteousness and salvation. And lo Lord, we just love you. Love you, Jesus. Pray, we pray for a great day today. Um, we pray for all our teachers, God, and our pastors who preaches. We pray for uh, Scott, for uh, Christine's Aunt Bev, for her health, for Scott's brother and his COPD and health there, for uh, Evan and his boss's sister, Lord, and her health, for Morgan. Uh, just to get better, and for Harold as he travels. We pray for the steen rods, God, as uh, we pray for Israel, and we think of Israel, and we think of how crazy this world is going. Uh, God, I pray for the true family, Lord, and the salvation of the family, and God, just for the morning, and um, I love you, Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. You may be seated. All right. So uh, just real quick, uh, just um, so for Missions Conference, uh, we're going to have four different families. If you're interested in helping, what we're going to do is like 
So we're going to have, what we're trying to do is we're going to have uh, each family in on a certain night, and uh, however many families of our church sign up, you'll, you'll see Miss Lori, she'll have a theme and everything, and that group of people will prepare a meal for that family, and you'll get to fellow, eat, eat with them and fellowship with them, and it's a chance for our church to get to actually meet our missionaries instead of just pastor taking them out or Brother Rich taking them out. Uh, you'll get a chance to meet a certain family that's coming. So there's a sign-up sheet for that. Don't worry about what you got to make or anything like that. Miss Lori has all that. And if you have any questions, see Miss Lori. Right. You you will prepare the food. Um, you will prepare the food, but she'll like have a theme night and give you an idea of what to make. And then so let's say there's two families involved. You guys will prepare the food. You'll bring it. You'll serve it. To, and then you'll eat with the missionaries. Okay? So... Whether we just have a couple families or not, and I mean, if we don't have folks sign up, we'll we'll take care of that. So we're not uh, we're not forcing anybody to sign up. But if you want a chance to get to meet them, this is a, a great way to do that. So there's a sign up sheet on the back for that. There's also a sign up sheet um, on the back for the family camp out, which is only in about two weeks now or three weeks. And so uh, we're we're kind of hoping to maybe play a family game on Friday or Saturday. But we need families, and uh, on Friday night we'll have our big meal, probably hots and hamburgers. We have a sign up sheet for side dishes but we need to know who's coming to that so we would love to have you for that and put on that how many like what days you'll be able to be there for okay and then this week is a uh, normal week uh, teen choir on tuesday soul went in wednesday church and then um, of course friday clubs amen all right if you grab your hymn books once again and turn to hymn number 185 185 rock of ages 185, we'll sing the first and the last. 185. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from the riven side which flowed be a sin, a double cure. Save me from it, guilt and power. While I draw this bleeding breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to the world, under yon thy judgment throne, rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Amen. All right, at this time, Brother Al will lead us in prayer for the Sunday school also. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you for another glorious day in your house with your people and your word. And Lord, just thank you for being our solid rock and our salvation. And just meet with us today. Give us words to hear, to follow and obey, and do your will. Yes. Bless this offering you should give for your good and your glory. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. amen. Right. Well, um, good morning, adult Sunday school class. Good morning. Trying to figure out here where I left off. Challenge. We left off the challenge. I think we did the challenge, and they will walk with God. Where these guys have this. I have it marked. There we go. All right. So we're talking about the church at Sardis, if you would. Um, and I think we're on the challenge here. Okay. Sorry, I apologize for that. I'm just trying to get my, my notes here in line. So the, so, so the challenge. So we're looking at the Church of Sardis. For those of you that weren't here, this was the church that was dead, that did not know it was dead. But 
it was still alive. In fact, that they had members and there were some good folks, and, but they were doing some bad things and they were about to die. You know, if you're about to die, you're still not dead. You could fix that, okay? So we got to the challenge portion, and um, the challenge, and I'll just go through some of these real quick. Um, let me see, I've already looked at this. So the challenge, there were still some uh, who were not dead in spirit. That's a fill-in, okay? There were only a few, though, and I'm just going through some of the things I have highlighted here. In every church, there was always a remnant of people who had not defiled themselves. And what I love about my church is, I think the remnant are the ones who do defile themselves. In other words, I don't think we have a lot of folks who live wickedly in this church, okay? Um, they had not defiled their garments, their outward appearance. Okay, I'm just going over some of the fill-ins I think I've already covered. Do we already have these? Okay, all right. Um, another fill-in is they will walk with God in white for they are worthy. And I'm looking forward to that day. You know, again, I've shared with you I'm kind of struggling with some things for the last couple months. But God just always gets me through it. And, and my fear is uh, that, I, I mean, I, I fear that I won't be able to preach sometimes. I, I mean, I, I actually get, I get a um, little anxiety now when I preach, and it's, it's weird because I've never had that. I've always, just, you know, and, but I still love God's word, and I, but I'm, I'm looking forward to that day when Jesus comes back and I ain't got to mess with this stuff anymore, you know. So they will walk with God in white for they are worthy, and white is the color of worthy. And then I, I ended up with uh, overcome, um, the word overcome. Sorry, Brother Miller, I didn't give you a chance to yell that one out. I'll still give you a candy bar anyways, because you usually get it. Uh, the challenge here is to overcome. Let me see, where is that here? All right, so on your fill-in where it says verse 5, write in the words overcome. He that overcometh, you know, that's the same with every church. You're starting to see the pattern to that, overcome. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot, blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And some of this has to kind of deal with the, those saints that make it through the tribulation as well. Father God, today as I come to you, Lord, in our lesson on the, the, the dying church, Lord, the not dead but dying church, Lord, of Sardis, and as we go into the church of Philadelphia, God, I cannot do this, God, without you. So I pray, God, that you would just give me clarity and what I say, and if there's things I'm not sure about, God, that you would just help me with that. And I love you, Jesus. Amen. All right, so we're looking at the word overcome again. The word overcometh here means to conquer, to carry off the victory. Uh, metaphorically, Christians, to Christians, that means hold fast to your faith. You overcome. You overcome, um, you overcome the things in life, okay? Okay. Um, he that overcomes the deadness. He that overcame temptations. He that overcame his fellow Christian members falling into the world. Uh, just because others fall don't mean we have to. Okay? He that overcame the pressures of compromise and tolerance. And I'm, I'm kind of looking at this church here, what those people had to overcome. You know, the ones who were faithful in an unfaithful church. See, we're, there's a lot of faithful in a very faithful church in this church. So we really don't have to deal with that. But what if we did? Would you still be able to overcome? Most people maybe might leave the church and go to another church that's more faithful, but some stay, okay? So what would they receive for overcoming? We see the same would be clothed in white. Now, again, I think a lot of this is talking about those that make it through the tribulation period, but we're talking about this church, okay? Number one... Um, what would they receive for overcoming? The same would be clothed in white. The same would be clothed in white. And white, again, represents just our godliness, our, our cleanliness. Um, Isaiah 61.10 says, For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. And I believe that's just a picture of salvation. It's a picture of righteousness, okay? Um, the same would be those who turned, okay, here's your filling, from their sin. And... To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So, in application, um, I believe a lot of these scriptures, when we read them, the overcometh part, really are talking about those that endure through the, the tribulation. You know, because we, we cannot be blotted out if you're saved, okay? Um, but, uh, but what he's sharing with these saints um, 
are, are those who would, who would be turned from their sin, okay? So the same would be those who watched and strengthened those things that remained in righteousness. Today we are encouraged to overcome. Um, and again, it, it's hard preaching this lesson to this church. Um, but let me say this. If, even in your own Christian life, maybe, I'm not saying you're dying, but maybe there's areas of your Christianity where you feel kind of dead. You know, I, um, I will say this. My prayer life is not what I wish it would be. I mean, I always hear guys say, ah, oh, if you can't pray an hour, there's something wrong with you. And there's something wrong with me. Because I struggle praying an hour. I'm just going to, I mean, does anybody struggle praying an hour? And so, so Satan will, will accuse you, what kind of a Christian are you? Or are you a Christian? Or, or, you know, I mean, sometimes, I mean, I'll pray for maybe, you know, I mean, I, I pray for 20, 25 minutes, and that to me is pretty good. You know, it's not good. And I hear guys saying, you can't pray for three hours? I can't. I mean, I mean, I run out of things, you know. Um, and, you know, and don't necessarily feel bad how you pray like you know like everybody says you got to get up early in the morning I don't really get up early in the morning I I pray when I get off work when I'm driving and so Saturday I'm like okay I should get up at five but, but it's my only day and I want to sleep in and so so as long as you pray you know I mean the Bible says to get up early rise up early and people have different schedules I think God wants us to pray okay so so I wrote here, a flicker can be rekindled. So if there's an area in your Christianity where you're dying, it's still not dead because you're still a Christian and you're still alive. Rekindle it. Rekindle it, okay? Throw a camping chair in it and it will rekindle. And I say that because my solo stove, remember when I burned down part of the camp, which, by the way, has flourished wonderfully. I mean, it is so green there now. Um, somebody said... It's a good thing you did that. I'm like, no, it's not a good thing I did that. But it worked out well. It has, I mean, it's green over there. That, that little, that is green. So anyways, where I was going with that. Oh, when I left that fire, I wasn't being irresponsible. I mean, that fire in my solo stove was almost out. It was embers. But the wind blew the, the chair in there, and those embers reunited quickly. What I'm saying, not to dog myself, but is that you can rekindle things. If something's going out, just add a little fuel to it. You know, if, if you feel guilty about your, your prayer because you don't pray, just start praying. You know, give God 10 minutes. And then if you feel kind of bad about 10 minutes, give him 15 minutes. You know, you and don't feel like, okay, well, well I heard somebody say, I, pr I pray for an hour and 20 minutes. Well, you're not them. Just pray. All right? Zechariah chapter 3 verse 4 says, And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him and unto him. And he said, Behold, I have caused thee iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee, clothe thee with a change of raiment. If you're saved, you have a new change of raiment. And I love that. Um, we are part of God's priesthood. Uh, Psalms 132 says, Let thy priest be clothed with righteousness. And let thy saints shout with joy. All right? So maybe you're, you're one of those, um, hey, so I wrote here, maybe you're one of those being worn today. Okay? And I'm not saying anybody is, but it's not too late to rekindle those things that are dying. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Um, Isaiah 118 says, come now and let us. Reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. So you can rekindle, you can clean, you can fix. The church members in this city were surrounded by some pretty vile and immoral pagan practices. Okay, And they may have become involved with them, but they could still wash their garments. Okay, um, All right. Number two, we see their name would not be blotted out of the book of life. And again, this is kind of reference again to the, to the, to the saints that survived the tribulation, okay? Because they have to endure through it all, okay? But we see that their name would not be blotted out of the book of life. And basically, that's salvation. If you're, if you're saved, your name cannot be blotted out of the book of life, okay? When you think of overcoming, understand, it's not speaking of working your way to heaven, okay? It's just, it's just, Overcoming is overcoming what hindered you from being saved, okay? Um, 
in that sense. But overcoming is also overcoming once you're saved. There are things you overcome. I think we understand that. So I won't spend too much there. Um, again, the only way, though, your name truly stays blotted out of the book of life is if you're saved. Understand that. Once you're saved, it cannot be torn out. Number three, and I love this part. He says, I will confess. It, and I don't know how you want to write all this out. But number two, if you want to fill it in, says their name would not be blotted out of the book of life. And I went through that kind of quickly. Okay. Let me, let me read number one for you, too, so you can write that down. I probably did that one quickly as well. Number one would be the same would be clothed in white. Okay, the same would be clothed in white. Number two, their name would not be blotted out of the book of life. And number three, I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. There are two things that will happen at your judgment. Either Jesus will confess you before God... Or he will deny you before the Father. And if that is to take place, then your next judgment will be at the great throne judgment. And then you're in trouble because there's no out on that one. Okay? So the judgment seat of Christ is the one where you want Jesus to say, to where you want him to confess your name. You want that there. All right? Um, I have a bunch of notes here, but I'm not really going to go into all this. I love this um, in Exodus chapter 32, 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Okay? Um, but if you're, if you're saved, you cannot be blotted out. And I love that. All right. So, so let's go ahead and look at it. And we'll wrap this up. So what we're looking at is the church of Sardis. They were a dying church. They didn't realize they were dying. And, you know, there's a lot of churches out there. That they have activities, man. They're running, they're running stuff. They're running food kitchens and food pantries and bingos. And, and they do a lot. They do good stuff. I mean, um, they help people, but they're not helping them where they need help. And, and they're spiritually dead. They're a, they're a church, and they're dying, but they don't know it. But there's some also some, 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 some Baptist churches, I think, that are going through that as well. So just some things on the church age. Uh, the, the, I call this the Sardisian, uh, and you can, these are your note, this is your fill in here. The Sardis or Sardisian, or fifth church age, it lasted from 1520 to 1750 AD. And again, these are not necessarily dogmatic, but they really do line up with the scriptures. And things that we've shared are, very, are indicative of this church period, okay? Um, J. Vernon McGee wrote, this is a great picture. Well, I had great. This is a picture of Protestant, Pro, Protestantism. And the great truths which were recovered in the Reformation have been surrounded by a compromising church. Okay, so the Church of Sardis was considered the Reformation church age. Now, this was the church period where people started breaking out of Catholicism. You know, your, your Martin Luther's and your, your, your Presbyterians and your Methodist churches. But they weren't exactly true churches either. They were, they were still dead, but living, okay? Uh, the churches of the Reformation were truly still dead in a sense, where they didn't preach the gospel. They broke away from the mother church, but they still had issues, okay? Okay. Um, they did not watch. They did not remember uh, what, what they had learned. They did not hold fast to them like the Church of Sardis. Um, this age was also the age of the Renaissance when, when, when things were starting to... You know, the interesting thing about, about the Dark Ages and the Renaissance was it went from black to colorful, okay? It went from darkness, the Dark Ages, to colorful. People started painting things and, you know, because they were breaking away from the darkness. But there was still a lot of deadness in the church. It was the age of Martin Luther. Um, the word Sardis actually means the escaping ones. They tried to escape the mother harlot church, but could not. And these churches, in a sense, have always held on to the traits of their mother. And you see that in the, in the, in the book of Revelation in the end times, when it talks about the harlot church and her, and her daughters or her children. Those are churches that came out of her. And let me tell you this. We are not a Protestant church. You do know that, right? Baptist is not a Protestant because we, we didn't break out of the mother church. We were never part of that, okay? And I'm not slamming on Catholicism. I'm not, but it is what it is, okay? All right. 
This period saw a tremendous beginning to return to the word of God, but never really completed it. Let me read this verse, and then we'll be done with the church of Sardis. Um, Matthew 13, 44. If you want to turn there, Matthew 13, 44. I shared with you on Wednesday when I was preaching for Brother Bowman. He came up to me as I was going. He says, hey, Brother Young, I'd like you to slow down a little bit with your verses. He says, I make everybody turn to every verse. He says, I read it, and he says, I don't pr stop preaching till I hear all the pages turn. Uh, stop turning. Now, I'm not going to do that, but I, I was doing that. For that. It does slow you down. It does really slow you down. Um, now, I don't do that for every verse, but I think it's good that we turn to some verses. All right? Matthew 13, 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. You know, that's what salvation is. You don't, you don't get it until you find it, you know, or until he finds you. The, the, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Um, and, I, and I say that because salvation is something that changes your life. And when you find it, you know, when you find salvation, truly sal find salvation, and you get saved, things that you used to so hold on to really lose their luster, true? I mean, man... Um, you think I'm crazy with football. Now, you know, this is the first time this season I've wore a football tie. Because, no, don't get me wrong, I still love football and I still follow the Bills, but just, I'm trying just not to get so crazy about it anymore, you know? But, I mean, before, I got, you should have seen me before. I mean, you know, um, yeah. All right, well, I don't know. I'm still pretty fervent about it. I'm still fanatic, yeah, so... <laughs> But the, the things you, you used to, that used to mean so much to you, like put it this way, I would spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars buying football cards and football stuff. I don't do that anymore, you know, because things have changed. My priorities have changed, you know. Giving to missions is, a, is you know, more important than that stuff and tithing and, and living for the Lord. The things I used to do, I don't really do them anymore, you know. Um, so I wrote, uh, no wonder the fifth age goes right along with the other ages and will do so uh, until its end in the lake of fire. So, so in other words, this, this fifth age rolls right along, but now we're coming out of the mother church, and now we have new churches, but they're still dead, but they had a name. you know. And if I mention the Lutheran church today, the Lutheran church, the Methodist church, I'm just going to be honest, I don't want to offend anybody, but they are just dead. They do nothing for the cause of Christ. They do nothing. As a matter of fact, um, now, like, you get, like, some Presbyterian churches. They still preach the gospel. And uh, Bible churches preach the gospel. Some do. Uh, but churches like Methodist, Lutheran, they do not. As a matter of fact, they're the churches that are starting to really um, encompass the Sodomite community. So they're really hurting the cause of Christ now. I, I hope, you know, and then even some Baptist churches are, I mean, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. All right, so that is the Church of Sardis. All right, let's go ahead and jump into something. Here we go. Philadelphia, take your notes. Hopefully everybody has notes. But now we're going to look at a very encouraging church. We're going to look at Philadelphia. Now, if you were to drive through the city of Philadelphia, you probably wouldn't be encouraged. You're not going to find a lot of spiritual stuff just driving through the streets of Philadelphia. If you make it there safely at all. Lock your doors. Even if you're on I-95, lock your doors. Even if you're not even in Philadelphia and you're thinking of going to Philadelphia, lock your doors. Yes. So, however, we may be going there and spending a few days there for Christmas. So, lock my doors. Um, Philadelphia. The church, here's the theme here for your notes. The church of the open door. And this represents a great church period in history. But we're going to talk a little bit about the Church of Philadelphia. And I have a lot of notes here on their history, but I'm not going to go through all of these. Okay, so, by way of introduction, I would say that this was a good church. They are actually one of the only churches that have no condemnation, Brother Lewis. That's, pretty, that's a good thing, okay? Uh, they're a solid church. As we will see, one that received no condemnation in its behavior for its service for the Lord. It was a church that God could use and open doors for. I love that. 
as a church in the world, we live in it as an example of keeping the faith and a good, solid testimony. We also live in a day where the doors of evangelism are wide open. And they are. They really are. Um, the other day, me and Stephen were out and we were door knocking. And Stephen never had this happen to him before. We knocked on the door and a gentleman opened it, said who we were, talks about the church. And he just slammed his door. I mean, loud, hard. And I was like, you know, I've had that happen before. So I'm like, okay, I'll just go on. And we got outside. Steve was like, wow, Dad, I've never seen that before. I'm like, well, welcome, welcome to the club, buddy. I mean, I mean, I said, that happens. And, you didn't, and then at first I didn't see it coming because the guy kind of looked at me. And then once he realized, once it clicked who we were, I mean, he didn't just shut the door. He slammed the door. But that's one out of probably 100 doors I've knocked on in, in the last however long I've been knocking on doors last couple weeks, months. You know, uh, most people take it. Most people are like, no, 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 I'm good, you know. But a lot of people do take that track. Or the, nowadays, a lot of people aren't even opening doors. They're saying, who is it? I hate those. I say, I'm from Dr. Baptist Church. Can I put something in your door? Sure. You know, because they don't want to open it anyways. Sir. First time you ever seen it. R right. Because Stephen does go door knocking. I mean, he does go out. He's never seen that. So, yeah, good point. Good point. All right, so we live in a day and age where the, where the, where the, where the um, doors of evangelism are wide open, okay? Um, they had a little strength, the Bible says, and we'll look at that, but they made no excuse for laziness. Okay, so historically, today it is called El, El Hasir, and it is a farming town located 30 miles south of Sardis, 105 miles east of Smyrna, okay? It was, it was in its heyday, a center of Greek culture. It had a heavy Jewish population, celebrated for its excellent wine. I say that because the god Bacchus, which they worshipped, was sort of like the god of wine. All right, um, It was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 17, but rebuilt. Um, so I'm going to give you a story here, which I find very interesting, and I love this story. I'm just going to read it. Um, there was a king there. Um, he was given the title of Philadelphia, or Philadelphus. That's he was given that title by his brother and predecessor, King Eumenes, the second of Lydia, because of his loyalty and admiration of his older brother. In other words, twice this king uh, Attalus had the opportunity to take over his brother's kingdom. He could have overthrew him, but he refused to, because of love for his brother. In other words, he had the opportunity, the, the, the encouraging by others, hey, take over your brother's kingdom. And he said, no, I will not do that. He refused to out of love for his brother. So King Attalus, um, he was named Philadelphia, which means love of my brother, which is, you know what the name of the city, you know what the slogan for city of brotherly love. It's not now. It's a city of brotherly lock your doors. <laughs> right? But that's what Philadelphia means, is love of my brother. Love of my brother. And that is very indicative of this church, because they were a church that loved their brother and, and that they, op they took those open doors. Okay? Um, all right. Love of brothers and sisters. And the New Testament, the love which Christians cherish for each other as brethren, a good... A good um, you know, 1 John 5.13 tells us that for these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And one of those several times you'll see in that book, loving your brother or your sister. A good indication that you're saved is your love for your brother. And, and when you get saved, how you view Christians ought to change. All right? In the New Testament, the love which Christians cherish for each other as brethren, it's, it's big. Okay? Um, the city uh, lies under Mount Camolis on the banks of the river Kagamis. Okay, that's just something you might want to know. It has been destroyed by an earthquake. All right, let me see. The city itself lied in the center of major trade routes, which made it seem as though all roads passed through Philadelphia. Um, all right, it was a, a, a city, uh, its chief source of winemaking, and Bacchus, the god of wine. And I just say that because that's who they served. Uh, the coins, their coins were the head of Bacchus and the figure 
of some other priestess, okay? But the, the, the population of the city did include Jews and Christians of Jewish origin and converts from heathenism, okay? All right, so I say this, just, and we'll see kind of this as we roll along. So it was a pagan city, okay? It, it, but there still were people there that loved the Lord. All right, so let's go ahead and look at Jesus' description um, to the church of Philadelphia. Verse 7. Verso 7. Siete. Si. Capital 3. Si. We good? Bueno? All right. I, I, I try not to forget they're there. I, I try not to forget the Spanish ministry is there. Every time again I look, I, I'm like, oh man, I'm flying again. I try to be slow. But it's like, it's like I try not to eat that fifth piece of pizza too. Actually, I've been doing very good with that. I mean, I have. I mean, I don't know if you notice it, but I've been doing very good with that. I try not to. Eat, I I do better with that. I'll just say that. You know, instead of twelve, I'm down to eleven pieces. All right. And that's without locking my doors. All right. So the description of Christ to the church at Philadelphia, verse seven, verso siete. These things saith he that is holy. So this is description. He that is true. He that hath the key of David. He that openeth and no man shutteth. And shutteth and no man openeth. That's a very encouraging verse right there. This is, well, okay, I wrote this. This is very encouraging description of the one who still is in charge of the churches today. You know, the one who controls this church is still holy. He's still true. He still has the key of David, and, and which, no man, which he openeth and no man shutteth. So let's look at these uh, descriptions. Number one, he is holy. A right church needs to be holy. We need to preach on holiness. We need to have standards. We need to do right. Okay? You know? Uh, Jesus is certainly the holy one. He is the holy one of the church. That's your fill-in. Holiness in itself absolutely um, belongs only to God. Uh, so how, how am I saying this? Holiness in its, its absolute self. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Your fill-in is the word absolute. Holiness in its absolute self belongs only to God. Now we can be holy, but we get that from God. And we can only get that in God in salvation. All right? Jesus wants this church in Philadelphia as well as our church, as well as all churches, to know that he is holy. He is the Holy One of God. A fact denied by many religions today. Um, Jehovah Witnesses deny that, okay? But Jesus is God. He says in the 16th Psalm, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Okay? So we could say, And unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things, he had, uh, he that is God is a holy God. And to the, to, the, to the pastor of the church of Patuxent Baptist Church, he that is in charge of your church is the holy God. All right? As a true church, we need to remember that. You know, and I, I feel myself coming under conviction a lot lately just for things I watch or things that, you know, listen to or whatever not. But why would Jesus want that description uh, why would he want that description to go to this particular church? Remember what we saw in this description of the city. There were many gods in the city, well, mainly Bacchus, uh, that they worshipped in Philadelphia, and Jesus wanted him, them to know he was God. Because sometimes when you're surrounded by a lot of bad, you start not seeing God for who he is, maybe. You know, it's easy to get corrupted in, in what we live now, okay? Um, Okay, so going on. The second thing is he that is true. The word true means genuine or real. There is a lot of religion these days, and I'm sure there was much in ancient Philadelphia. You know, they had their gods. They had religion. You know, they had coins with Bacchus on it, and I had some other stuff written. I'm not going to go through all that. And Jesus wanted this church, faithful church, to know that this message was coming from him that was true. 1 John 5.20 And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true 
and we are in him that is true, even in his son Jesus Christ, that is the true God and eternal life. Um, Jesus is real. Not, not the goofy stuff you see on television. I, I mean, I, I, wrote some, I wrote this long ago. This, I wrote down some things like holy laughter. Um, there was this, this guy named Benny Hinn who used to teach this thing called Stuck in the Holy Ghost Glue. I don't even know where you go with that. Slain in the spirit. Holy laughter. That's where you just uncontrollably start laughing for the Lord. Like speaking in tongues. There's all kinds of, all kinds of weird stuff out there, okay? But there is true also. And unfortunately, people follow the other stuff because it's showy, all right? Jesus was the true God. Revelation 3.14, the faithful and true witness. Revelations 9.11, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. He is the true God, okay? Um, it does rhyme with glue, but it certainly ain't true. Not the glue for you. There are other things to do. Let's go on. All right. Uh, so, throughout Scripture, Jesus is described as being true or genuine. In John 6, he is the true pan de cielo, bread from heaven. Yeah, the true bread from heaven. Come on, I tried. Was that good? Abby? Abby gives me a thumbs up. Mrs. Dapp here looks at me like, bread from heaven. Pan de cielo. Okay? De cielo. De. Oh, del. Oh. Because it's plural? Del? I thought from was de. Okay, let's go on. <laughs> hey, I was close, man. Okay, from the. Oh, because the. From is de. From the is del. That I understand. Okay. Lo entiendo. Sorry. Lo siento. Un poco. All right, he is the true vine, John 15. He is that which is true, 1 John 5, 20. So how does this apply to us 2,000 years later? He is still true. You know, if he told us in Malachi to tithe, it's still true today. If he told us to love our brethren back in 1 John 2,000 years ago, we're to do it today. He's still true. All right, number three, he hath the key of David. And he hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth. Basically, the key of David represents, and here's your fill-in, the perpetual throne of Israel. There is always a throne of Israel. And someday the king will sit back on that throne again, which I believe is David. Okay, But he, the key of David represents the perpetual throne of Israel. Isaiah 22. Dente y dos. Isaiah 22. And the key of the house... Of David will I lay upon his shoulder. It's talking about Christ. So he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. And we see this here. Okay. So um, in a sense this is a clear connection to Jesus. Who prophetically possesses the power over the throne of David or Israel. Okay. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Wouldn't that be wonderful if our government was still upon his shoulder? If we had a president? You know, supposedly he still is very supportive of Israel. You know, we just need to pray that we stay supportive of Israel. Okay? And it's amazing how many people are not. Verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order and to establish it, okay? All right, so, so, Israel, you know, the throne, the throne never dies, okay? Even though there isn't necessarily a throne there now, it is a perpetual throne, and he is that, okay? Number four, and this one I love, all right? <laughs> Number four, he that shutteth, this is your fill-in, he that shutteth and no man openeth, and openeth and no man shutteth. You want to write all that you can. He that shuts 
and no man can open. What he shuts, no man can open. And he that openeth, and no man can shut. I love that. Job said in, in 12, chapter 12, Job 12, Behold, he breaketh down, and it cannot be built again. Is everybody with me? He shutteth up a man, and there can be no opening. But what this is saying is God is in charge. We grow because he allows it. Um, he opens doors. Jesus said in Matthew 16, he says, said unto Peter, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He says, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You know, right now, you have the car keys to salvation. That's how I look at it. When, remember when you first got to learn how to drive and maybe dad gave you the keys? Keys are power, buddy. Man, I got a, me a whole slew of keys. I can get into pretty much every room in this building, okay? Except for that one shed out there. I can't get into that. Ke Kevin, Kevin Dunn, Jimmy rigged it or something. Keys are power. You can get into everything with keys. And he has given us keys to the kingdom. I find that very, I preached a message on that once. I find that very sobering and very fantastic that we have keys to bring people to Christ. You have the keys to people getting saved, in a sense, okay? Um, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, and I look at that as whatever you, you win on earth goes to heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So there might be some souls that you could have won that may not go to heaven because of you, not winning them. I mean, that's kind of a hard burden to bear, but... You know, it's, I think it's true. Jesus has the authority to open and to close. Today, the same principle applies. He opens the doors and he closes them. I think of, uh, we have, let me ask you this. Does anybody know who Brother Hoblitz is? Raise your hand if you know who Brother, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. Raise your hand if you know who he is. Raise, I'm not trying to embarrass you, so I won't make you raise your hand. Brother Hoblitz is one of our missionaries that we have supported ever since I've been in this church. I remember when Brother Hobbits was here in our last building, which was how long ago? 23, 24, 25 years ago? I remember Brother Hobbits from them. And he's one of those guys who you don't hear a lot about. He doesn't get here. He doesn't get to care. You know where he is? He's a missionary in Russia. He's in Georgia, I think. Georgia, Russia. And I think about that because there's still a door open there. You know, we hear a lot about Russia. But there used to be a time when doors were not opened in Russia, just like doors are not open in China. But you know that doors for missionary used to be huge open in China. You remember back in the 1900s, and, and well, some of you maybe remember the 1900s. No. In the 1880s, China was a huge missionary, just a huge missionary place. But today, you can't have a church there. And if you do, it's got to be in secret because God has shut the door. And Russia used to be like that, but now the door is wide open in Russia. Well, sort of wide open, but it's open. You know, uh, Brother Hoblitz and his wife Nina, they've been there for a long time. You know? All right. So, condemnation. Look, look at their con commendation, not condemnation. So, let me just read this, verse 8, and then maybe we'll go ahead and just do a couple things and be done. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And think of how you say open in Spanish. Un, what? Abierto. Un puerta abierto. Uh, open door. Okay. I have set before thee an open door. I love that. And no man can shut it. No man can shut it. You don't have to go through it, which many Christians don't, and they should. For thou, he says, for thou hast a little strength. Get that. They weren't strong, but little is much when God is in it. And has kept my word, and has denied my, denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from, an hour, from the hour of temptation. And that's very important. That's important to us. That shows that we're, we're pre-tribulation. That verse right there is one of the verses we use because God 
has kept us from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. You know, I was talking to Lee Bowman, and Lee Bowman is just one of the, he's just a great guy, but he's very firm in what he believes. And, and he says that whenever he has a conversation with somebody who's mid-tribulation, that means that Jesus is coming in the middle. He says, he says to the guy, well, if you're mid-trib, you're a coward. He says, because if you're mid-tribulation, why are you not up in the hills of Wyoming building a fort for your family? Think about that. If you truly believe that Jesus is coming halfway through, that means your family is going to live halfway through the tribulation. And being a Christian, you know what's coming. So why aren't you building something? Think about that, because you're not really mid-tribulation. If I knew, if I knew a hurricane was coming, I knew it. If you knew it, what would you do? You would prepare for it. You would batten down everything in the back. You know what's funny? Whenever we would get a hurricane watch or a snow watch and they were shutting down, you know what I would always buy in the store? Frozen pizzas. I just figured you got to have frozen pizzas. you got to be able to, even if there's no luck, you just got to buy frozen pizzas. I would always buy frozen pizzas. That was how I would stock up. My wife's like, why would you buy frozen pizzas? You know? But anyways, you would prepare. If, if I knew that that brother Bob was coming to rob my house, and he had 14 shotguns, and Emily had, a, had an Uzi in there. I would prepare my house, you know, and, and little baby Blair with three bows on, ready for action. I've never seen that child without a bow on her head. I've never seen her without a little bow on her head. I want to call her little baby beer blow bow, little baby Blair bow, bow Blair. Okay, anyways. But I'm serious. If you knew that... For three and a half years, you were going through the tribulation, and you knew it. And you don't know when, when the rapture's coming. Wouldn't you prepare now? If I knew, Pastor, that the first seven seals and maybe some of the, 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 the trumpets, I was going to be part of that, I would be digging a bunker somewhere. Because remember, you're still saved. It's not that you can lose your salvation. So you will have to... Refuse that mark. See, I'm just saying, mid-tribulation makes no sense. Uh, so, anyways, I said all that because he shall keep us from the hour of temptation, meaning we're not going through any of that, okay? So, there are some things um, I want to share with you about this. Number one, the open door, and we'll go ahead and just, we'll go ahead and, and just do that one, and then we'll be done. So, your first, your first fill-in is open door, letter A. Your second fill-in is no man can shut it. An open door. It's a direct application to the Church of Philadelphia. I believe this open door was the door of, here's your fill-in, evangelism. We have an open door of evangelism. Okay? He gave to Philadelphia an open door or free course, if you will, to evangelize those around them as he has given us today. You know, what are these doors? Missions, door knocking, helping other churches, okay? Going to our own lost family members. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me. Um, there are doors open. We just got to go through them, all right? Acts 14, and when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. And then we see this. And okay, I'm going to end right there. Letter B, no man can shut it. No man can shut it. No man can shut it unless God shuts it. The doors of Russia will not shut until God says it's shut. The doors of America will not shut I, I, I wish our borders would, but spiritually the doors of America will not shut until God says it will. All right, we'll continue on this next week. All right, what is today, 10-17? All right, be back at...